thanks for tuning in to Telecast. Each week, we speak with TV's movers and shakers to get the latest insight and opinion on industry developments. There's a new episode every Thursday. Our website, telecast.com, includes additional exclusive feature content from TV's thought leaders. Articles are free to read. Just register on telecast.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to Telecast. Well, it got me in the end. Yep, I tested positive for COVID at the weekend, so I'm recording this week's show from isolation in my daughter's bedroom. So apologies if the sound and my voice aren't quite up to scratch. Anyway, the show must go on. Telecast, the TV industry news review. On this week's Telecast, I'm joined by Vincent Tafort, boss of Dutch indie Vincent Productions, and Alex Morris of Lad Studios, Lad Bible's factual entertainment division, as we discuss what TV formats are working now and why, and what's coming next. Plus, the production secrets that make Lad Bible Group the biggest publisher on TikTok, and the world's all-time most viewed and engaged publisher on Facebook. It's all coming up on this week's Omicron special, Telecast. My first guest on this week's show is Vincent Tavort, boss of the largest indie production company in the Netherlands, Vincent Productions. Welcome to the show, Vincent. Hi, Justin. Thanks for inviting. So Vincent Productions has got a growing reputation around the world. For those who don't know the business, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how the company has grown over the past few years? I've been working in television for the last 26 years now, starting off formally on the radio uh, when I was studying, and then I grew into television and was addicted from the first day onwards. So over the past seven years, me and my wife Vera have founded Vincent TV Productions together with Ruud van Breugel, our business angel, and um, Vincent TV stands for Vincent Television, of course, but also for Vincent Terfoort, which is my last name. And, um, well, we just kicked off starting with nothing except from a lot of ambition and experience because we thought that there was space enough in the Dutch television business for a newcomer. And it proved to be the right decision as it gave us a lot of pleasure and meanwhile also success, although it's not the easiest business to be in, of course, but hey, that we did know already. Yeah, it's been tougher in the last couple of years for many, particularly on the production side, than perhaps for many of those other years. So you say yourself that you and your wife started building the business with your angel. Did you start with a focus on adapting foreign formats for the Dutch market? The actual first commission, which I got two days after founding the company, I was lucky enough to sell it, was a sequel series to a format that I had devised when I was still working with a Sony affiliate in the Netherlands. It was called I Can Make You a Supermodel, a reality series in which a supermodel scout, Paul Fisher, uh, just scours the streets of the Netherlands, known to have tall women with blonde hair, to find the next new supermodel for the big brands. And that show we sold and instantly produced and it was a success. And the second series we sold was Verdict on Demand, which is still on air, 150 episodes uh, we produced over the last seven years. And that's a judge who rules in quarrels between uh, neighbors or people that have done business together and uh, disappointed each other. So it's mostly talent and cast-driven reality television that really got us going. Yeah, I've seen that format that you mentioned and Legal House Call. Tell us a little bit about that format because it's a really interesting one. It's travelled around the world, hasn't it? Uh, it has not yet, no, because most territories think that it's very difficult to find a judge willing to host on television. 
in some countries, people think that there's legislation to prevent judges from being on television, which mostly is not the case. So Legal House Call is a spin-off series from Verdict on Demand, as we got so many applicants on Verdict on Demand. But in most cases, when you have a complaint, the guy or girl you're complaining about doesn't want to be on television. And Verdict on Demand requires to have both parties on television and being ruled, being judged in front of an audience, and then also to live with this verdict. When you are a complaining party and uh, your neighbor doesn't want to be on television, that's where legal house call comes in. So legal house call advises the people. And we even created a spin-off of legal house call And that one we produce now for 300 episodes in a daily version as well. And that's when we invite people with complaints or questions to the studio to be advised by judges of different kinds. So there is a whole realm of uh, juridical shows that we created. I think last year we produced 350 hours of juridical shows in the Netherlands only that I think should travel. Well, fingers crossed for that. That's a lot of hours of television there. So tell us about your operations in different territories, because you've recently opened a business in the UK, but I think as far as I know, that's your fourth territory. Tell us about your international expansion and what your aims are for your different businesses. Well, the aim of our business is to create formats that entertain and inspire people. So the, first of all, we wanted to expand in the Netherlands. And then when, after, say, four years, we, we were successful enough to kick off with an affiliate we created ourselves in Belgium. And that affiliate now exists for three years and is a business on its own. So Bel- the Belgian market is quite comparable to the Dutch one. So that was quite an easy step. Then the next step was to decide on two new territories to expand into. One being the UK, where we have a successful but still small creative unit who's on the verge of selling shows to the UK broadcasters. The other experiment being to try to uh, start an affiliate in Scandinavia. And that didn't succeed. So we tried a lot. We tried to find the right people, put in some money, but we found out that in that territory there wasn't enough space for a newcomer. For instance, Banijay has a market penetration of 70% in Sweden only. So that's ridiculous. But hey, it's the case. Uh, oh, so so th- that, that market we chose not to continue in after half a year of uh, uh, trying. The UK, however, uh, is, of course the most important market for all of us, probably, besides the US. Uh, But the US isn't really well accessible for us. So how about Germany? That's right on your doorstep, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you got plans to set up a new business in Germany in the coming years? Yes. The chances in Germany will depend fully on people being available, people of quality and and, uh, reputation being available. So Germany will be the next on our list to expand into. But you need to have the right people. So we're on the lookout for the right people in Germany. Okay, well, you heard it here first. If anybody knows anybody. Presumably this is somebody that you're looking at who's already a successful producer, a development producer, who's got a great relationship with the broadcasters and a strong creative sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, good luck in your search. I won't be invoicing you with any sort of headhunting commission there, Vincent. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll send you a bottle of champagne. Ah, okay, right. Well, I'll, I'll hold you to that, Vincent. Um, so it's not only the formats that you've created, the original formats, which sound like the real engine of your business, but you've also adapted some of the world's biggest formats for audiences in the Netherlands. Tell us a little bit about those. I think it's fair to say that almost half of our business in the Netherlands is based on third-party formats. Half of the titles we produce, it's slightly less in hours. We do produce more original hours, but when it comes to the number of formats, it's uh, it's almost 50%. And that's because 
there is there are so many channels in the Netherlands, so the interest and appetite is big to uh, to, to to commission, uh, and we do have one of the best. I might say the best, but one of the best uh, scouts of third party formats, Lisette van Diepen, uh, within our company, and she was the one to um, bring to us several shows that not only were successful but also were acclaimed and won prizes. For instance, Five Days Inside, that's the show distributed by Magnify coming from NRK in Norway, that when we adapted it to the Netherlands, a host that's going to live for five days behind closed doors in an institution, and we won the highest ranking prize in the Netherlands uh, for it, the Golden Televisier Award. That's an audience award. So, and that really put us in the center and, and, and... the year after, we also won this Televisia Award again, so for the second time. That's when it got easier for us to uh, acquire formats like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Dragon's Den, Drag Race, and the likes. And those formats today are very important for our local business. On the other hand, when you look at Belgium, it's, for us at least, far more difficult to sell third-party IP in Belgium. So there is some interest in all of the formats I just mentioned, but they for most like and want to have original ones, talent-driven, cast-driven, formatted, but original ones coming from the local production companies. So there is a big difference between Belgium on the one hand and the Netherlands on the other. You say Lisette van Diepen was your scout and able to identify the NRK format you mentioned and other formats. I mean... What would you say is special or what makes the Netherlands a great country to adapt formats in? What is it about the audience that makes it different, for example, than Belgium? Well, on the one hand, we do have a lot of channels. Of course, with the platforms coming, the number of channels or or platforms is increasing dramatically. But we do have like 10 or 12 clients at least, if not more. So the demand for content is big and um, for instance Drag Race uh, it took me five years to sell it after having acquired the rights from Passion Distribution but once we got it on air we got a second commission we're now discussing a third series uh, on Videoland so this Drag Race is an iconic series about identity sexual identity but identity in a, in, in, in a wider perspective and uh, I think when you have the demand on a platform to acquire new subscribers then you need to choose from the big brands even if they are quite niche like Drag Race to put yourself in the picture so I think in a territory like ours where all platforms are entering last year and this year already having like 10 linear broadcasters airing daily, there's always demand for more content and you just can't develop it all by yourself. And when it comes to working and living and developing formats in the Netherlands for the international market, we've seen obviously Netherlands has become one of the territories around the world that's punched way above its weight when it comes to international format success. What do you think the secret ingredient there is? I mean, what is it about the Dutch culture, do you think, that enables, you know, a big brother or one of those other huge formats to go international? What is it about, do you think, about the Dutch culture that perhaps enables you to be successful internationally more so than, for example, some of the other European territories that may be even bigger than the Dutch market? Well, the Dutch culture and people are known to be very adaptive very adaptive since i think 500 years ago they're also always open for business they have no objections a priori to reject opinions or cultures that are that are new so the, the dutch audience quite easily adapts and accepts new formats they don't like them all of course it depends on how it's executed, if, if they are timely produced, is it urgent, the story? But they are very much open to new ideas, new concepts, new shows. 
So the shows you're mentioning, of course, they have defined genres in television worldwide, uh, like Big Brother, still on air. Uh, the Voice, of course, it didn't define a genre, but it became a, a hit like, like, like not too many others. The Dutch audience is, is, very, is, is, is a very interesting and well-informed group of people. It's, it's just 17 million people on a very tiny piece of land. I think we have the least uh, square meters per person in the world when it comes to countries. And we all ha had already had cable television when it wasn't common, very common. Or, uh, I have to say, cable internet. So, everyone's watching a lot and we're interested. So, that's why in our culture, I think a lot of ideas grow. On the other hand, there's a very short time between pitching a show and producing a show. So where it would take 12 or 24 months in the UK to uh, create a show in the Netherlands, I think legal house call, as you just mentioned, I created it in five weeks, not only made it up, but also delivered it. That's of course not a giant format like, <laughs> like the ones we just mentioned, but sometimes in the Netherlands, we, we, we are really quick on turning an idea uh, uh, onto a, a show that's on it. How did you cope during the worst of the lockdowns, Vincent? Um, I know the Netherlands has, more recently than many other countries in Europe, had a severe lockdown in the, in the last few months. How have you as a business survived during that time? Was there any support from the local government in the same way that there was in the UK when it came to insurance schemes? Do you have that sort of governmental support or was it something that you just had to dig in and get through? Yes, in the first stage, there was support from the government for all companies, so including television. But we uh, didn't need it after a few months because when we took the right cautions, we were able to at least continue shooting shows that didn't require too many people on screen. We only have problems in uh, shooting uh, studio shows, for instance, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? But there we just halved the audience and put everyone at least one and a half meter from another. Our programs are mostly character-driven reality series and those you could easily keep on shooting. The other way around, when uh, studio shows were less easy to produce, the demand for reality series increased. And that's exactly what we created. So we were, after a first full stop and almost heart attack for everyone, including myself, able to even grow our business during COVID. And uh, last year actually was our best year ever. Well, congratulations on that. And I think we're certainly seeing that this almost pent-up demand and all of these streamers, and all these new players, you know, commissioning like crazy. So it does really feel like it's a boom time right now, more so in unscripted as well as scripted, which seemed to lead the way in the past few years. When it comes to formats then, in terms of trends going forward, obviously we've all been through this incredibly difficult, stressful time and many people have reacted to it in many different ways. But now we're sort of starting to come out of it. How do you see consumer trends and audience trends? How would you think that that's going to affect the formats that you're developing, not only for the Dutch market, but within the UK market and the Belgian market as well? How do you think that's going to affect the sort of shows that people will be looking for in the next year, say? Well, I think people are, are, are very much looking for uplifting shows to be entertained with, as they've always been, but will far more be looking for in the next year, to be entertained, but also to be coached. The funny thing is that uh, there is a format that we are producing already for five years. It's a hat-trick format called Rich House, Poor House. I think we've done like 80, 90 shows so far. Uh, it's a reality series uh, with, with every week new cast, of a rich family changing houses and income with a poorer family. So for one week, they switch everything. The rich family can only uh, spend 50 euro in a week, and the poor family is allowed to spend up to 4,000 euro a week. 
And this series that we've launched in 2017 is by far more successful today than it was two years ago because people now, due to COVID experience, and that's, that's tragic, but it's true, a lot of stress. They have less money to spend. Inflation's rising. People are insecure about their financial future. So shows that touch this subject in an entertaining way that you can very easily relate to, those will be in demand, I think, in the next year. On the other hand, with all platforms now entering our market, we already had Netflix, we already had Prime Video, but now also HBO Max, Viaplay, Disney, they're all coming. They just need more content of high quality. And at first, they are all looking at high-level drama series. That's going to be very important, especially with an original uh, and, and local feel to it as well as reality, which always reflects today's culture and the, the, everything that's top of mind. Now, if, if someone was to come into the TV industry right now and they were to set up their own production company, let's say they were coming out of college, they're not necessarily a really experienced executive, you've got a wealth of experience over the past 20 years or so in the industry, both domestically and internationally. What tips would you give them, you think, if they were starting off now? What would be your advice to a new young producer? I'm doubting whether I would say create video. I, I might suggest kick off with podcast and develop it into vodcast. Not because I know that that's a very fruitful business myself. We're not into those. But I think that's today a very low threshold medium uh, to enter when you are in the business of sharing stories of telling stories so the, the, the lowest threshold to become a media producer today is produce a podcast when you're adamant to be in the video business uh, then i think look around you and put a put a, 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 a and 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 that what you what inspires you make it bigger. So whether it's poverty uh, somewhere down your neighborhood, whether it's uh, an exciting new youth culture that you cycle by uh, going home, take something that really touches your heart, and then try to create some kind of reality format around it because reality television is easier to produce when you start than a studio show or than fiction and now it's time for story of the week the tv industry news story that's caught vincent's eye in the past seven days what's your story of the week vincent well i, I got two tiny ones if i may i may um so first of all Netflix celebrates its 10th anniversary of its first original production, Lilyhammer. And I think that at the time, 10 years ago, when I worked uh, in Cannes at uh, MIP TV and I saw the first signs of Netflix, uh, the first brand billboards at the hotels, uh, I thought, what's that? Why are they doing this? And I watched Lilyhammer, which I instantly liked very much. I even tried to acquire the rights from... Uh, Lasse Halberg, one of the creators, or the creator of Lilyhammer, to uh, reproduce it in the Netherlands, which I didn't succeed in. But Netflix, 10 years ago, really changed our business for good. And we, I could not envision, of course, how and with what kind of impact. But I think the demand for video has ever been increasing, but it's almost doubling by now because of the platforms. So that's, that's really something to, uh, to celebrate today. The other news that I'd like to um, focus on is that FRAPA, that's uh, the organization we're part of for the, the protection of formats, uh, appointed Eric Cafu as MD. And Eric used to be, until recently, 
um, the coordinator of our development department in the Netherlands. So I'm really proud that he switched to Frappa and, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to him being active as MD because it's very important, of course, in our business that uh, the, the formats we create are protected. We can't protect everything, but you can't protect everything in life. So we have to live with that. But it's very, very important for us as a business to have uh, an entity that that you can go to when you run into problems or when you need advice. Well, good luck to him in his new role. How do you see IP theft or IP infringement right now, Vincent? We had a situation in the UK fairly recently where an indie producer was making a claim that a broadcaster had taken an idea that he pitched to it and then essentially saw the same idea being commissioned by another production company a few weeks later. Do you see a lot of that in the Netherlands? And do you see it becoming more of an issue? I don't see it becoming more of an issue. I I think it's fair to say that whoever is on air first won. Uh, That's not only because it's fair, but mostly because you have to agree to some understanding because so many people have ideas and so little (laughs) companies are able to launch new shows on air. Having an idea is just stage one out of five, at least. Then you have to develop it. You have to write it up. You have to find partners. Then you have to test it. Then you have to sell it. Then you have to get the right amount of money for it. You have to acquire the right time slot. And even when you've done that, you have to produce it at the highest standards. And Then you have COVID and other kinds of risks to influence your product. So... To have the same idea, I I have no doubt that today at least four other people in my territory will have the very same idea on a new show that they'd like to develop. But it comes to the next stages right after, to getting all your ducks in a row. And then when you're lucky, you're going to have success. That's just how the business works. So no, I don't see an increasing problem, but I do think that it's important to be very much aware of the juridical context that we are all working in. And now it's time for Vincent's Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin nominations. Vincent, who's your Hero of the Week? Well, my Hero of the Week is uh, not a person today, but a platform. The platform being YouTube, because as you might have heard, in the Netherlands we uh, have had an issue or are having an issue with some music coaches in the voice format everybody's familiar with. That's right, yeah. And there has been one journalist that has done all the research on these voice coaches and the band leader. And he launched this research, which was a one and a half hour show, including even John the Mall at the end, responding to some uh, questions and he launched it on youtube and i just checked he has had over 10 million views to date which is extremely extremely much um i did win a youtube award uh, in 2019 with only 2 million (laughs) views so i can easily say that this is far bigger than any show has ever done in the netherlands i think so, cheers to YouTube being the platform to uh, um, uh, uh, comment on television. We'll add a link in the episode description to that clip, Vincent, so everybody can go in and take a look. How about getting in the bin? Who or what are you chucking in the bin this week? Well, I think the whole of the Netherlands wants to throw Jeff Bezos in the bin, not because of him being the owner of Amazon but him being the commissioner of the largest sailing ship ever being built in the Netherlands, and uh, as it's been built in the village of Alblasserdam, uh, it has to be transported to the sea this, uh, this season, next spring. But there is a very old historical bridge in the way, and for this uh, sailing ship to be able to, to go to the sea they have to dismantle this historical bridge 
I have to say, in all honesty, that I think I'm also proud, not on the, the Jeff Bezos for choosing Dutch product, but for us, Holland, being able to build the best uh, and biggest custom sailing ships in the world. I'm, I'm, I, as, as an individual, I'm quite proud that we have to dismantle this historical bridge. <laughs> so uh, not everyone will agree, uh, and I'll put him in the bin, but within the context of uh, us being a proud nation too. Yeah, a proud seafaring nation as well with a storied history. But yeah, maybe they could have just put the shipyard, we could build a whole new shipyard, surely on the other side of the bridge with the amount of money that they're going to get off Jeff Bezos. But there we are. Yeah, yeah. As a, it should cost over 400 million, this ship. And, and the suggestion has been made like you, you just did to build a whole new shipyard. But then the, the, the people that work on the shipyard have to move all as well and to be the best builder of ships comes down to the best having the best people and 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 that's where it's exactly like in television it's not only having the best ideas on the best channel it's having the best people producing it it all comes down to having to work with the best individuals vincent thank you so much for coming on telecast really enjoyed chatting with you and hearing about the dutch market and format creation and format adaptation wishing you all the very best and everything that goes on at vincent productions will we be seeing you in a few weeks time at uh in can at mip tv will we see you down there absolutely and at london screenings i'm very much looking forward to travel again finally vincent thanks so much for coming on telecast we'll see you soon my pleasure thanks my next guest on this week's show is Alex Morris, director of Lad Studios, the data-driven factual entertainment division of Lad Bible Group. Hi, Alex. Welcome to Telecast. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. Getting straight into it, Lad Bible have become world leaders in social publishing and content creation. Can you give us a bit of an insight into how the Lad Bible brand has developed over the years into what it is today? Sure. So Lad Bible started as a, a, a publishing brand, you know, predominantly focused on, on words and pictures. And with the advent and growth of social video, that's really allowed us to explode into new platforms as they've evolved, but also launch our own brands that um, broaden out the, the core offering. So we now have nine key uh, channel brands. Uh, we speak to a very broad mainstream audience on video, our audience is actually nearly uh, 60% female. And we are able to kind of operate in that broad mainstream way with content. But we also have some niches and areas of fandom like gaming and tech uh, and adventure. So it allows us to kind of dive into those areas as well. Sport, it's another big area for us um, in Sport Bible. And, you know, we'll continue to build those brands further so that the, the suite of channels can operate much like uh, a network. So, you know, we, we can behave a bit like the modern version of a, a, a TV network, allowing us to run our shows and our content across our suite of brands or quite specifically um, in one of those homes, if appropriate. It sounds from what you say, when the business started from a sort of words and pictures business, if you like. It sounds very similar to Barcroft Studios in a way, which is obviously where you spent a lot of your career. How different is it or how similar is it to Barcroft Studios? And how, how should we be looking at the Lad Studios team in terms of the way that you operate on a daily basis? I think there's, you know, a lot of similarities and differences. Obviously, we operate in similar spaces. I think it, at its core... Barcroft as a business started as a, a B2B company, initially creating content for others, whereas I think at its heart, uh, Lad started as a B2C business going direct to audience. And I think those are probably the kind of, you know, in the DNA, those kind of differences I think are, are interesting. Um, and I think at Lad Bible, we've developed this fantastic, potent media brand and that's a really exciting opportunity to build up from that, as, as I mentioned before, growing out the other brands and the other channels. As a business, we're, we're, we're set up so that we can make the most of those opportunities. We have a big sales division 
focus at focusing on monetizing our audience by working with brands and helping brands connect with mass audiences. And that sits alongside what we do in studios, which is obviously creating content direct for audiences, which we monetize on uh, directly on those platforms too. So we, we, we kind of behave a bit like a publisher and a bit like a, a, a channel network. And for us, it's the power of the, that um, media brands that really helps us reach that mass audience and, and kind of allows us to innovate with content, much like a lot of digital business, you know, testing and learning is really, really important for us. And that's kind of a key part of the way that my team set up so that we can make the most of creative opportunities, but at the same time, using all the data that we get back from audiences directly to help create what the next round of shows or the next content iterations might be. And we're always testing whether it's show types, show themes. We've done been doing a lot of A-B testing recently around uh, different types of edit style, for example, of the same content. So that's constantly uh, how we, that's how we're set up to constantly kind of feed that next iteration of content through the data that we get back. Well, that's what I think is really interesting about Lad Bible and Lad Studios in the sense that you've got that scale now. You're producing 800 pieces of content in the last two years of original content. That's extraordinary when you're also allowing to test and learn and see what works and then work it into a slightly different format and engaging with your audience, not only through data, but also hearing what people really like to consume. Yeah, absolutely. And the scale is is incredible. I mean, actually, last year, we produced 17,000 pieces of video across all of our channels and networks and platforms. And it really is, you know, uh, the, the scale that, that that's really exciting. And, you know, you've got to be careful with the data, because obviously, you get an awful lot of it, it can be easy to be overwhelmed by data. We have a, a data analytics department here who we work with very, very closely. And we can feed specific topics through that prism to help us understand how content's performing. But we also have a lot of young social specialists who work very, very closely with specific platforms and on those platforms, kind of living and breathing it so that they can really natively understand audience engagement. Because a lot of them behave very much like the audience would behave and they consume content in the ways that the audience consume content. And so it's that mixture of cold hard data and the kind of touchy feely side of creativity mixed with that really deep understanding of the platforms themselves. And it's those things working together that really fuel our output. It's not just millennial teams that you have creating this content for a millennial audience and a a wider audience than that, actually. But you've also got a team of senior former TV industry execs, haven't you? That, That must help enormously on that development side and that creativity side you just mentioned absolutely it's that combination of craft and kind of creative understanding how can we take the best of that traditional creative knowledge and understanding production approaches and meld that with you know some of the innovative ways that we operate so you know in 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 the team here we've got you know x channel 4 x endemol um x red arrow uh staff who really have worked for many years in the content business and really bring uh, their expertise and craft, which which helps us, I suppose, hit those levels. You know, we have a lot of different production styles from really high volume, fast turnaround social content, right up to quite premium series and everything in between. And I think that knowledge that we have uh, and the skills that we've built up in this team uh, you know, over time uh, are what give us uh, a real advantage there to make the best out of, you know, all the learning and development that, that, that people have done in those more traditional production media uh, and bring it to our kind of fast turnaround digital world. Now, you've got a remit to build your department by 50% by the end of this year. Can you tell us a bit about how you plan to do that and, and what what that department build is going to look like? So, you know, a big part of it's kind of doubling down on the uh, network approach that I mentioned earlier, building out our brands. We've got some new brand launches in the pipeline for for new channels, really building out the hubs that we have. Uh, If you think of the kind of Lad Bible set of brands that we have with Food Bible, Sport, 
Bible, gaming Bible, big areas to grow into there. Then we've got a Unilad suite of brands where we have Unilad Tech, Unilad Adventure. And then we've got Tyler, which is our kind of more bespoke female skewing brand and real opportunities to grow and build uh, a set of brands within that. So that, that's, that's one element. So really doubling down on, on, on the brands that have been growing. So for example, Food Bible last year uh, has been a massive growth story. It actually grew uh, 300,000%, which sounds uh, ridiculous, but it was a, it was a fairly dormant channel um, and there was a big opportunity to lean into it and, and, and grow it further. So that's one part of the strategy, doubling down on those brands that we have across our network. And then the other element is building out our show brands further, building out a really distinctive slate so that we have a, a really clear offering. Um, we've grown an awful lot on, on Snapchat in the last year, uh, and that's a, a big opportunity for us too. But having those shows that can sit across that network and really drive engagement through those is something that's really exciting, building out products like sponsorships uh, around our core slate. So yeah, that's the, the, that's kind of the, the main approach is really leaning into that network capability and the opportunity there of growing those master brands and building those suite of shows that sit across that network. And you mentioned show brands, and this is something that is becoming more and more crucial, I think, isn't it? Is in terms of discovery and in terms of awareness with the audience, it's building up those show brands. Can you tell us a little bit about what's successful and why it's successful for show brands underneath the Lab Studios umbrella? Yeah, so we, we've used shows in a number of different ways, and I think they, they add value in lots of ways. I think you know audiences primarily want to engage with great content, and what show brands give us is an opportunity to, to package that content into really distinct themes. So on one level, it's, it's great for us internally to help us really hone the creative around certain types of content that people want to interact with online. I think it's also important from a B2B perspective and, and our place in the market. It helps us build IP and how we can build that IP out into new products, whether that be podcasts or live events, which are things that are, we're ambitious about in the future. We have certain brands that have done really well for us over over the years and, and have come to sort of, I guess, define some of what we do. We have a, a show called Minutes With, which won Broadcast Digital Award for, for Best format best digital format which was a really exciting moment for us and a really big moment uh for the business to be acknowledged by our peers for for the quality of the production so that's that that's that's one type of success we also have show brands which are very attractive to talent um so we have a number of formats agree to disagree and snack wars where we've worked with an amazing range of a-list talent from, you know, The Rock and Tom Holland and Ed Sheeran, people like that. So they become real calling cards for the business and uh, they become brands that other people really want to get involved with. You have nine core channel brands. You mentioned that there may be some more on the uh, on the horizon that we can look forward to seeing launching. And all those brands sit across social channels, including YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok and Instagram. Can you tell us through the process of, so you're creating a new show brand. Presumably, you have to tailor that show brand for all of those different, very different types of formats. How how does that process work when you come up with the idea and say, yep, we think the audience is going to love this, or we actually have data to say that the audience is going to love this? So how do you develop? Do you have separate teams, like a TikTok team and a Snapchat team who will work with that content and fashion it into the ideal format for their social platform? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really important for us is having, and I think I mentioned this before, kind of having certain people that really engage very specifically with certain platforms. They kind of get to live it and get to know it and understand them really deeply. For example, we, we did a, a, an episode of our Agree to Disagree show with uh, Tom Holland and Zendaya recently. It was really successful for us. We did a, a long form on YouTube that was about 15 minutes long. And that was cut in, I suppose, now what you could say almost a more conventional way. I think I think everyone's quite au fait with the kind of, you know, digital edits, which are quite high pace and, and you know, you get to the point quite quickly and, and they have quite punchy openings that, 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 that draw you in. But that was, that was a longer piece. But what we're able to do is in the production process, plan out certain questions or certain elements that we might take out, which might 
make a, a sh- what's now thought of as a short form. So interestingly, not that long ago, um, most digital social first content was called short form content. Now short form really re- refers to things that are a minute or less. And short form content as a result of TikTok is becoming hugely celebrated again. Uh, it used to be a bit of a dirty word, I think. And um, now YouTube have a short form product in shorts. Obviously, Instagram have reels. Uh, TikTok has really changed the game in terms of the way people interact with that shorter form content. So we really focus on that. How we chop out certain parts of our longer films that are standalone short form stories where you don't need to see the rest of it. It's just that piece of information, that story, that mini excerpt of a conversation and making that feel really like it was designed to be only that long in the first place. And that's a big part of our production process, thinking about that right at the beginning when we're we're starting an episode, but also once we've got the footage, it's about understanding how to really optimize those little moments and turn them into TikToks or turn them into a reel so that they can play out in those shorter form spaces. Well, it's clearly working. I mean, uh, just looking at some stats here, Lab Bible Group is the biggest publisher on TikTok with 27.2 million followers and the world's all-time most viewed and engaged publisher on Facebook as well. So that it's incredible stats that that you are, you know, leading the way on at least two of those massive social media platforms that people are engaging with. I mean, here's another stat here that uh, a total of 980.4 million engagements in content in 2021. And 50.3 billion video views. I mean, that's that's uh, that's just it is extraordinary. It's a, the time when you know numbers get so big, it sort of blows your mind a little bit. So it's whatever you're doing is clearly working really well. Yeah, look, it's effective. I think there's there's you know there's still a lot of of growth opportunity. There's still a lot for us to learn and keep evolving into. But you know, it, it's very effective at the moment, and I think that. You know, and it's it's a really exciting place to be. It's exciting, you know, communicating with mass audiences. You know, content that we do on social is inherently global, which is also interesting. It allows us to tap into different audiences in different countries by working with the different platforms. You know, you, you touched on this before. We're able to communicate with different age demographics. So for all those reasons, I think it's why we're able to hit those big numbers. And I think that, you know, by not sort of pigeonholing our content into a certain age group by being broad about it it allows us to communicate to lots of different people so the content can look and feel very differently on one platform to another and and feels absolutely right for the tiktok audience who who perhaps wouldn't be on facebook for example you're the biggest publisher on tiktok so what makes a great tiktok clip then so if you've got a listener who's uh, who's a producer and they're you know they're, they're thinking oh you know maybe it's time we should dip our toes into social if if they haven't already what makes a great tiktok clip and how do you go viral with a with a tiktok clip well how, how do you go viral is a bit of a 50 million dollar question i wish i could answer that entirely and then we could do it with every single um video but look the TikTok is a, as a platform, it's about making content look and feel native to that place. So, for example, and we do this now quite a lot and we do it on some of our other platforms as well, content that from a production point of view might look and feel more like UGC. It might look and feel more like the people themselves have filmed it. And sometimes they actually have, you know, it's under under our direction or we're able to, you know, work with people to get hold of their footage and then we might interview around it. So it's about making it feel very immediate, not too overproduced you know and i think you you look at something like youtube now it feels very very different it feels to me when i look at youtube more like a the the, like a premium tv channel sometimes because content is produced almost like it is for tv and you see some of the big youtubers now invest absolute fortunes in the way that they produce mr beast being the uh, obvious example there but i think tiktok is more about the immediacy it's more about uh being able to make a connection with the viewer in an incredibly short space of time so the content needs to look and feel like it was meant for that platform and that usually means that it has to feel very instant uh and very immediate now what one of the things that barcroft studios did to great success and and this was you you were obviously a key part of this was was really building the relationships with the tv industry and building your show brands into longer form content or ways that you could work with and support 
more traditional linear broadcasters. What are your ambitions for the future for Lab Studios and, and how do you see your business collaborating more widely with the TV industry going forward? Yeah, I think it's an it's a it's a great opportunity for us. As I mentioned uh, earlier, historically, you know, Lab Bible was very focused on a kind of B two C uh, business and, and and communicating directly to the audience, and we're not going to stop doing that, and we're going to keep continuing to grow that. But I think there's some exciting opportunities as we evolve our show brands further to look how we can take those uh, into TV collaborations, whether that's through, you know, commissions and, and us working very directly with commissioners or whether that's, you know, licensing some of our IP or, you know, producing formats in-house that we then, you know, distribute directly to to broadcasters. Those, those are all models that we're exploring and all things that I'm keen that, that we, you know, delve into. I think it would be, you know, it's an exciting opportunity to, to go – really digital into TV, but finding those crossover points where our content and our approach to content production will work for commissioning partners. And we saw maybe a little uh, taste of that. There's a, a show was commissioned in Australia by Amazon Prime Video from your uh, Australian team. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so that, that, that was a project that they worked on uh, in Australia. That was a show called Unheard. It was our first TV commission, important and big moment. It's a great series that tells the story of racial segregation in Australia and people's experience of racism. And um, yeah, it was a very powerful series and something that our our team did there directly with Amazon in Australia. Uh, And it's definitely a model that we want to do more of, uh, whether it's in Australia or or more globally. So yeah, that was a good good calling card for us to, to have done that and an important step for the business. And now it's time for your story of the week, Alex. What's caught your eye in the past seven days in the TV industry? Well, the one that caught my eye, and I suppose uh, it, it says a lot about, you know, the way that, you know, Lad Bible are looking at content. But I, I thought it was really fascinating that YouTube top Netflix in terms of quarterly revenue for, for Q4 2021, uh, when they announced their revenue figures. I think that, I think it's the first time that that's happened and, you know, for, for YouTube to, I think they delivered 8.6 billion and Netflix was 7.7 billion uh, in Q4 2021. And I think showing the potency and power of AVOD at the moment, you know, I know everyone's excited about subscription models. There's lots of subscription streamers launching all the time, but it's really interesting to see that AVOD is still very much in the mix and growing. Now we're looking at all these fuel bills that are going to start dropping on our doormats in the next few months and uh, inflation. I think maybe people will be just taking a closer look on uh, on those subscription services that they've got and maybe, maybe trying out a few AVODs and seeing if they can uh, cut the SVOD cable, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, it's an increasingly busy and congested market. And I think it's going to be an interesting couple of years in that SVOD space because people probably will start deciding what one they want to keep. And uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. And I think that, you know, AVOD channels, and you see it happening a lot in America, are really picking up new audiences all the time. And it'd be really interesting to see how that kind of develops over here too. And now it's time for your Hero of the Week and Get in the Bin nominations, Alex. Who's your Hero of the Week? So my Hero of the Week, and I guess it it's maybe it was a, a little bit longer than a week ago, but Joe Lysett is my hero of the week because I'm sure you've seen the story, but the way that he contributed to the Partygate debate, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Not only did he do it in a way that was really funny, but it had a real impact. And it was coming from a place of real emotion, having lost a very close friend of his to cancer during lockdown and not being able to handle the funeral and things like that in the way that he would have liked to. And so I thought it was a really powerful statement to do something that was funny, that somehow cut through all the noise that impacted the, the Tory party on the ground because it was taken seriously in the first place, his um, kind of spoof Sue Gray report, mm. but came from a place of real uh, emotion and passion. So, yeah, definitely my hero of the week. All right. Well, we'll put a link to that in the episode description so people can check that out as well as your story of the week. And then who are you going to tell to get in the bin, Alex? This is a difficult one because it's very hard for me to, to, to move much further away from, 
from Boris and, and Partygate still. I'm, I'm sure lots of people have said that. But at the moment, that seems to be the, he, he seems to be the prime villain, uh, unless it went to Jacob Rees-Mogg, who perhaps might be a step worse because he seems to be his most vociferous defender. So maybe maybe if 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 no one's picked Jacob Jacob Rees-Mogg recently, I'll go with him. Well, okay, yeah. Well, that's that's definitely a first. Bizarrely, somebody chose Boris for Hero of the Week a few weeks ago, which I, I'm still trying to get my head around. But there we are. Brave, brave choice. Yes, yeah. Um, so Jacob Rees-Mogg is going in that bin. Alex, thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy schedule. I've heard there's all sorts of uh, fire engines and sirens going on behind you. So uh, thanks for sticking with us through that. Joys of East London. Yeah. I look forward to speaking to you and seeing you in, in the flesh very soon, once I've got over this COVID. Get well. Get well soon, Justin. Well, that's about it for this week's show. I hope you've enjoyed it and it wasn't too difficult to listen to especially on your headphones. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. We've got a brand new website that includes exclusive feature content from TV's opinion leaders and journalists. They're all free to access. Just sign up at telecast.com. And why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Telecast was edited heroically by Ian Chambers and recorded in a bedroom in London. Until next week's show, as always, stay safe. COVID's not gone away. <laughs> <laughs>